Hello folks, Anahita Rao. Hope everyone is well. So today I wanted to speak about a very important aspect of Vedic astrology. I've made this video with those in mind that don't have much knowledge of Vedic astrology to offer a sort of introduction of an extremely vast subject. And especially I've made it with Nadia Shah and her viewers in mind as I also follow her channel and find her in-depth interpretations heartwarming and inspiring. So I hope you'll find it useful and if you have any questions please feel free to write your comments below and I'll do my best to answer. Okay so let's get started then. Now you may hear me use the term Jyotish and Vedic astrology interchangeably. They're essentially the same. The term Vedic astrology, I think, was coined in the 70s, I believe. Um, so, but in fact, it, it, what we're speaking about here is Jyotish. The heart of Vedic astrology is nakshatras, which are basically fixed star constellations. The calculations and predictions in Vedic astrology are made from the vantage point of the moon transiting a specific nakshatra in your birth chart. Whereas in Western astrology, they use a tropical system based on the position of the vernal equinox and define the zodiac based on the Earth's location with respect to the sun and therefore focus on sun signs as a primary reference point for interpretation. However, Jyotish is based on the sidereal system comprised of these fixed star constellations transiting the sky with special importance on the moon's placement rather than the sun. In other words, what you actually see in the sky at any given moment is what we're talking about with Vedic astrology. There's also a spiritual foundation with Jyotish, as the planets as well as the sky are considered to be our higher nature. In other words, divinity itself. And therefore the placement of planets in an individual's birth chart are considered the fruits of your karma, cultivated over many lifetimes. Okay, now back to nakshatras which is what I'm going to concentrate here on the video. If you look at the orbit of the Earth as it goes around the Sun, in Jyotish we divide this into 27 segments. These 27 segments are known as nakshatras. The literal meaning of the word nakshatra is that which does not decay. And each one of these nakshatras represents a particular quality of Consciousness. Each nakshatra has four separate parts, also called padas. So in total, there are 108 nakshatra padas in the zodiac. 27 times 4. 108 is a magical number in Vedic philosophy. The biggest practical usage for this is mantras, during mantra chanting. Because mantras are chanted 108 times in order to generate high energy which is then channelized into your intentions. And these mantras align with our bodies as well as our chakras. This number, 108, also connects to the luminaries, the sun and the moon, who are the life givers of our planet here. The ratio of the diameter of the sun and the distance between the earth and the sun is 108. The ratio of the diameter of the moon and the distance between the earth and the moon is also 108. And further, the ratio of the diameter of the earth and the sun is 108. Now, the other point about nakshatra is that each of them has a sound allocated to it. Now, in practical usage, how this, how this plays out is uh, naming of the ch a naming of children is associated with the syllables and the sound 
associated with the moon nakshatra a, a child was born in. Another practical usage of nakshatras. And yet, the most common usage of nakshatras is seeing compatibility between two people. Matching of a couple for marriage was primarily done by matching the birth nakshatra of the boy and the girl. That's traditionally. It's still widely used when doing compatibility matching. Another usage, which is also widely used, is deciding an auspicious time for a new beginning in your life, such as marriage, such as buying a house, such as starting a new business. We see that from the transits of where, of where the moon is going each, each day. And finally, if you can remember your moons or even your ascendant nakshatras ruling deities, during your daily prayer or your mantra, it can prove to be very beneficial as you are connecting with your own personal protective force every single day. Each nakshatra is associated with a ruling deity and a controlling planet. These deities have a very subtle but deep effect when al analyzing all aspects of your psychological and your spiritual life. The controlling planet of your moon's nakshatra also plays important roles in your life when it comes to making predictions in your chart. So how do you find out your moon's nakshatra? Well, in any Vedic birth chart, it will be clearly marked out. If you don't know where your moon was situated when you were born, then you can go to the free chart calculator on my website and plug in your details. I've got the link here below. It should then pop up with your moon's nakshatra. Remember, this is the sidereal system, so it may place your moon in a sign earlier from the tropical western placement. Now, the reason we consider the moon to be of paramount importance is because the moon is associated with your mind and thus controls your thoughts, emotions, and perception. Whatever happens to us is perceived and experienced through the moon the mind, which is the emotional filter of life. The moon works through the nakshatra filters. These are not rational or logical, but rather intuitive, psychological, and subtle. These are the linkages of your past lives and the framework of your present life. The life choices that you make are linked to your birth moon nakshatra and to some extent to your birth ascendant nakshatra. Thus, for an average person, the nakshatras and how they interact in the chart will feel somewhat faded. But if you tend to be spiritually inclined and have a sense of higher purpose of your life, you can actively use the energies of your nakshatras, their ruling planets, and their controlling deities. Since the moon rules over our subconscious mind, it makes sense to divide this into 27 nakshatras corresponding to the moon's waxing and waning cycles all month. So for instance, the moon spends about 2.3 days in each zodiac sign and approximately one day in each star constellation or nakshatra, spanning the entire month. Now I'm gonna go through all of the 27 of these star constellations and give you some small keywords, yeah? I'm also going to include like small bits of information for each nakshatra so that you can get a taste of what each represents. Of course, there's so much more to, to say about it. Um, now, nakshatras, as I said, describe our most, our innermost tendencies and desires. Often a person may not even be aware of them, but they will rule their lives and influence their actions. With many people, you can see their life's activities summarized in a few action words. These action words are a reflection of your nakshatra energies. The first nakshatra is Ashwini. The controlling planet is Ketu and the ruling deity is the Ashwini Kumars, who were the Ayurvedic doctors in mythology. And they're known as healers, observers, and innovators. So how would you use this information when looking at a chart? Well, we can see your talents and your personality through this filter. 
So for example, if you have personal planets such as the sun and moon sitting in the Ashwini nakshatra, then these action words, healer, observer, innovator, may resonate with you. Another way to use this in practical ways is that it could be the lord of your seventh house sitting in Ashwini. So then this could describe the character traits you look for in your serious relationship or your serious partners. Second nakshatra is Mparini. The controlling planet is Venus and the ruling deity is Yama, the god of death. And they can be seen as self-restrained, energetic and active. It's also the nakshatra of transformation and of extremes. The third nakshatra is called Kritika. The controlling planet is the sun and the ruling deity is Agni, which is the fire god. They're bright, they're quick and they're sharp. Now, the fourth nakshatra is called Rohini. The controlling planet is the moon and the ruling deity is Brahma. Rohini espouses creativity and fertility and is nurturing, cultured and maternal. The fifth nakshatra is Mrikshara. The controlling planet is Mars and the ruling deity is Soma, the moon. It has the capability to produce, grow, give comforts, freedom, and travel. Sixth nakshatra is called Ardra. The controlling planet is Rahu, and the ruling deity is Rudra, which is a fierce form of Shiva. It's known to destroy. It's associated with storms, with sorrow, with emotional upheavals, but also with strength. Seventh is Punarvasu. The controlling planet is Jupiter and the, rolling, the ruling deity is Aditi, the goddess and mother of many gods. The, the nakshatra symbolizes consciousness, unity, protection, learning and expansion. The eighth is called Bushya. The controlling planet is Saturn and the ruling deity is Rihaspati, also known as Jupiter. It's a nakshatra of wisdom, awareness, rituals, upward progress and generosity. Ninth is called Ashlisha. Controlling planet is Mercury and the ruling deity is Ahisar, also known as the serpent god Shisha. And this nakshatra is known for holding on and clinging to things, clinging to people, extreme behavior. They're also secretive and can be quite intense. Tenth nakshatra is called Magha. The controlling planet is Ketu and the ruling deity is the Pitris. In other words, your ancestors. It's the royal nakshatra, known for duty, authority, connections to ancestors and their energies. Eleventh nakshatra is called Purva Falguni. Controlling planet is Venus and the ruling deity is Bhaga, god of pleasure. They're resourceful, lucky, loving, sensuous, and compassionate. Now, the 12th nakshatra is Uttra Falguni. Controlling planet is Sun, and the ruling deity is Aryaman. This signifies healthy and strong physicality, marriage, official ceremonies. They are known to be respectful and intelligent. 13th nakshatra is Hasta. The controlling planet is the moon and the ruling deity is Savitar, also known as the sun god. This star signifies awareness, knowledge and brightness. Fourteenth is called Chitra. The controlling planet is Mars and the ruling deity is Vatar, the celestial architect. And thus the focus here is on outward appearances to build shine and outshine others and to compete with others is the pulse of this nakshatra. Fifteenth nakshatra is Swati. The controlling planet is Rahu and the ruling deity is Maruta, god of the wind. 
here the power is awareness of internal prana. They can appear lost on the outside, but they're very powerful and strong on the inside. Sixteenth nakshatra is called Vishaka. The controlling planet is Jupiter, and the ruling deity is Agni, the god of fire. It signifies politics, power, can be self-centric, but they have a royal aura about them. Seventeenth nakshatra is called Anuradha. Controlling planet is Saturn, and the ruling deity is Mitra, the god of friendship. It signifies companionship, it's a good ally, supportive, and they like working with details. Now the 18th nakshatra is called Jayasa, controlling planet is Mercury, ruling deity is Indra, the god of all gods, also known as the god of thunder and war in some Asian cultures. It signifies control, strength and power. Nineteenth nakshatra is called Mula. Controlling planet is Ketu, and the ruling deity is Nirti, the goddess of destruction. It signifies destruction, of course. It uproots and it scatters. So, we're on the twentieth nakshatra now, called Purvashada. Controlling planet is Venus. Ruling deity is Apas, the god of waters. It signifies purity cleansing, search for knowledge, and rebirth. 21st nakshatra is called Uthrashad. Controlling planet is the sun and ruling deity is Vishvadeva, also known as Ganesha. It is known to be noble, of good character, a leader, and a guide. 22nd nakshatra is called Shravan. The controlling planet is the moon and the ruling deity is Vishnu, one of the three gods of the Trinity. It stands for expansion, wisdom, teaching, and listening. 23rd nakshatra is called Dhanishta. Controlling planet is Mars and the ruling deity is Vasu, the gods of abundance. Signifies fame, wealth, creativity, music and dance. 24th nakshatra is called Shatabisha. Controlling planet is Rahu and the ruling deity is Varuna, the god of the ocean. It represents a burst of energy. It's philosophical but judgmental, strict but fair. 25th nakshatra is called Purva Bhadrapada. The controlling planet is Jupiter, the, ro the ruling deity is Aja Akapada, also known as the one-footed aspect of Lord Shiva. It's all about Tantra, purification, cleansing, darkness leading to light, and penance. 26th nakshatra is called Uttra Bhadrapada, trolling planet is Saturn. Ruling deity is Ahar Buddhana. Now this is also the serpent god, but quite different energy to the one signified by Ashlisha. This nakshatra gives the ability to access that kundalini energy. It signifies the deep subconscious, disassociation, detachment, an excellent nakshatra for meditation and any spiritual practice. 27th nakshatra is Revati. Ruling deity is Mercury. Ruling, sorry, the controlling planet is Mercury and the ruling deity is Bhushan, the solar god. This nakshatra represents guidance, protection, nourishment, and prosperity. Now, in some places you will see 28 nakshatra is mentioned rather than 27. The last one called Abhijit is ruled by Brahma, the creator himself, and reflects, reflects the creative principle, principle of divinity. But it is not used for a general astrological anal analysis. It is occasionally used for special calculations. When the moon transits here, it's considered to be very auspicious time to start any activity. 
So it's used, used mostly for Mahura type of calculations, um, trying to predict good time for, for something. Now, what's the purpose of knowing the controlling planet, as we talked about, and the ruling deity both? Well, the controlling planet is used to make predictions. For instance, you're going through the life phase period, which we call dashas, mahadashas. Let's say you're going through the mahadasha of Mars, and then we will look, in, look to see in the birth chart whether any planet is sitting in any of the Mars nakshatras. And those would be Rigshara, Chitra, or the Nishta. So now this becomes relevant for making predictions and what to expect during that particular phase that you go through. We can also get an idea of the personality in this way. For example, Chitra, also called the shining jewel of the zodiac, is controlled by Mars. Such a person will internally want to compete with and outshine others. Their ruling deity is Svater, the celestial architect, so this person will want to build, create works of beauty in the form of a book, plays, paintings, or it could be just an arrangement, a decoration of their own space. They may also be continually rearranging their mental and emotional processes till they're satisfied by how it appears to others. This nakshatra is most likely to remain unmarried or, if married, not too involved with their spouse because their real fulfillment is in creation coupled with power. Let's take another example. We can take the nakshatra called Uttra Bhadrapada. Well, this nakshatra, as we said, is ruled by the serpent of the deep subconscious, Ahir Buddhina. Saturn is a controlling planet here and symbolizes structured work. The person knows a lot, but more so within the astral, deep, subconscious, internal level. So, in other words, they may live in their head a lot. And as such, they may seem a bit spaced out to other people around them. But when it comes to occult knowledge, connection with their own subconscious, as well as their own intuition, they're very switched on. They have the capacity to do anything in the astral realm. So there you have it in a nutshell, all about nakshatras. There is, of course, so much more to talk about, but I wanted to give you just a brief introductory overview today, and I hope that you found it helpful and useful. And as I said, please feel free to leave your comments and feel free to subscribe for more videos. Cheers. Thank you, folks. All the best.